program here at Chatham House and delighted to welcome Mohammed Fahmi with us this evening. So as you'll know, um, Mohammed was a former um, AJ Bureau, Bureau Chief in Cairo. He's an Egyptian Canadian award-winning journalist and author. He's worked extensively in the Middle East, mostly for CNN. He covered the Iraq War in 2003 for the Los Angeles Times and entered Iraq on the first day of the war. Upon completion of his one-year mission, he authored his first book, Baghdad Bound. Mohammed spent the following two years reporting for Dubai television during the peak of the economic boom in the UAE. He produced a television talk show focused on the Arabian Gulf in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Oman. In 2007, he completed a one-year mission as a protection delegate for the International Committee of the Red Cross, protecting the rights of political prisoners, the missing, and refugees in Beirut. In 2011, he won the Peabody Award for his reporting with CNN and its coverage of the Arab Spring. In the same year, he won the Tom Renner Investigative Reporting Award for producing the documentary Death in the Desert. It's a long list, I'm coming to the end. In September 2013, he accepted a new post as the Al Jazeera English Egypt Bureau Chief. He was arrested and convicted on charges of terrorism. After successfully appealing his conviction, he was prosecuted a second time and sentenced to three years imprisonment in August 2015. On the 23rd of September, he was granted a presidential pardon. Mohammed, thank you for coming to join sit with us and very much welcome to Chatham House. Thank you so much for having me and this very kind introduction. It's really great to start uh, my path for freedom here in London. Me and my, my wife just are very happy to be here, officially free, finally, outside the Egyptian border, walking the streets of London. It's just beautiful and sharing the experience is something I'm very keen on, knowing that it's quite a complicated case that we've been through that brings in uh, many aspects and geopolitics and issues about press freedoms, of course, and new laws that have been initiated in terms of uh, presidential decree by the president allowing the deportation of citizens and um, other aspects that I would like to share, of course, with Excellent. our people. For Thank, sure. you. Thank you. If we could, in our sort of 20, 25 minutes, if we could focus on three areas, that would be great. One, I think, would be really good for the audience to, to hear is a little bit of the personal experience of your last couple of years. Second one, more broadly about freedom of expression across the Arab world, where, what the state of that is at the moment. And then finally, sort of looking forward, where do you see that tending? But if you don't mind us getting a little bit personal for the next five or six minutes, just so we all have a, you know, a clear understanding or we're all on the same page, because as you said, the case is very complicated. Mm. I've been trying to look at it in detail and you know, one ends up going in different places. If we could sort of summarize the last couple of years of your life, that would be a great place to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start with uh, the Egyptian revolution, January 25. I came to Egypt, I left Dubai. I was very excited to start a new life in Egypt. And I arrived two days before the revolution. I joined in and it was, from then on, it was a dream that we were all excited about, a new beginning, a new democratic uh, uh, movement. Um, and I you know, was working seven days a week, like many journalists back then, and it was a real pleasure to be there at the time. Um, and then, of course, we were going into Libya, and you know, it, the, the movement became uh, much wider across the region. And um, from then on, it was just one big story that kept we kept following on, and then the, um, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, came into power, and that was also uh, a new uh, era in Egypt's history. And then there, there came a time where I was pretty much exhausted, and I you know, wanted to start a new life with my wife and get married, so I decided to stay home and just write freelance articles and take a step back. And at that moment, uh, me and my wife took to the streets and we joined the protests. I had taken off my journalism cap and I was able to just express myself as a private citizen and I protested against the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, calling for their, um, for, you know, to 
change in, in government. Um, uh, what happened after that, uh, I, you know, I joined Al Jazeera English in September uh, 9 or 8, some along, sometime along that, and as bureau chief, and it was a challenge uh, that I decided, you know, us journalists, we like challenges, and it was a challenge because I knew that the Arabic um, channels were under scrutiny and they were under the microscope, but I did definitely view the English channel that had a, that they had a professional line and I respected a lot of the journalists that worked there and it was a great opportunity and I took it with stride. And, and um, for uh, December 24th, uh, I reported live uh, at night, 1.30 a.m., um, the decision that the Muslim Brotherhood were now declared terrorists. And I wasn't really sure what that meant. And I called a lawyer, at, and it was too late, and he said, we'll talk about it in the morning. Uh, so we planned to report it the next morning extensively. Ironically, four days later, we were arrested, me and my colleagues from our bureau, and uh, the law, uh, Article 88 of the criminal uh, uh, law, was exactly what was used in imprisoning us. So that's the irony there, and we were accused of conspiring with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, providing them with equipment and funding and uh, fabricating news to serve their agenda and issues related to licenses, and it was just horrific, and it was really shocking you know, and to, to just be overnight. You, you become part of the story, and you are now the main focus, and you are accused, and you, 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 you are living with the people you were reporting on. They're in the prison with members of the Muslim Brotherhood and jihadists, so it was a, a real emotional roller coaster throughout this period, and uh, you know the dream of Tahrir Square. You know, I think it sort of evaporated, and my imprisonment, I believe, is symbolic, more symbolic than uh, anything I've been through throughout these three years. Thank you. Could you tell us something about the imprisonment itself? I mean, how how is an international journalist? treated in a maximum security prison. You're there as an, as an international or as an Egyptian. I mean, how, how do the prison guards treat you? I mean, do they, do, they, do they treat you well? Do they treat you with contempt? Are they indifferent? And what about your inmates? I mean, I think you, I've heard you say elsewhere that you know, you're suddenly surrounded by the people that you would love to have spoken to. So in a way, I could see there's a <laughs> maybe a positive dimension, though I wouldn't want to put myself there with you. Yes, sure. Um, in the beginning, I was shocked because I, they placed me in the terrorism wing of Mohammed al-Zawahri, the brother of the al-Qaeda leader mm -hmm. and ma senior members of the Muslim Brotherhood and hardcore extremists that just came in from Syria and Libya. And, you know, for me, I thought this was going to be a one couple of days it's an, or one week, I'll be out. So, you know, us journalists, we spend most of our career trying to get so close to these uh, people who have no respect to democracy or humanity or anything that we live for. And, some of our friends died doing so, and so it was a, no, a non-stop exclusive, just interviewing them all the time, knowing that I'll be safe interviewing them from the cell for now. But then it became very evident that, you know, this was going to be an extended experience, and um, in generally we were well treated. However, the Scorpion Prison in, Ka in Egypt is a very tough prison for me and Bahar, we were there. Peter was uh, imprisoned with the seculars uh, in another prison. Um, you know, there was no uh, access to sunlight or outing and uh, very little family visits and uh, through a glass uh, barrier, um, solitary confinement for one month. Uh, it, 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 it was tough. I mean, any prison is tough, but this prison was extremely uh, challenging. Um, so we tried to uh, make the best out of it. We started a radio mock show. Uh, you could only see the faces and the eyes of the people across the, the corridor and the cells. And this was my chance to interview uh, leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood and jihadists. And of course, um, you know, I, I played what we journalists do, the devil's advocate. So I would ask the, the jihadists and extremists, what do you think of the Muslim Brotherhood? Did, you, did, did they come through and bring, you know, do a good job for you. They said, no, no, they're too soft, you know, they, we, asked, we told them to chop the heads as soon as they took the, uh, the rule, but, you know, they never listened to us, and that's why we're all here, you know. So it was just uh, a very, very uh, challenging, tough experience, and then w the whole mindset changed when it was referred to court, and now we knew we were in for a long time. 
And then we had to work on so many strategies and approaches and the families and it was a learning experience for everybody. The embassies were in, that were involved, uh, Canadian embassy in my situation, my family had to start learning how to deal with the media and so on. Yeah. Excellent. You were, I mean, somehow you were sort of caught in this, I guess, whirlwind of regional pl powers, international powers, sort of moving in, in, into this mix, into this space, yeah. and somehow you were sort of at the, at the fulcrum of that. I mean, were you, were you conscious of all those big changes taking place around you? Uh, s there were snippets of news that were, were slipping in during the solitary confinement, but, you know, again, thanks to my wife and my family, that 45-minute visit, I, it was like the, the, the only way of us getting information. I knew there was um, a s s unprecedented solidarity and the journalists that were supporting us outside is the reason, part of the reason why I'm here today. I mean, if I ever believed in journalism, this experience made it much more uh, valuable to me what, a ju what journalism does. It keeps your voice alive outside and even the guards and the, 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 you know, your jailer starts to realize that you know, this guy, a lot of people are fighting for this person and that we need to take care of him. We can't hurt him today, maybe tomorrow, who knows? But the point is that I did believe that a lot of the advocacy and the support and the armies and diplomats and uh, social media, specifically the social media was so, so important. And um, it, it meant a lot knowing that, you know, we were just not fighting for our th lives and our freedom, that, you know, this was now a bigger cause. We've become fighting for freedom of expression, which is very important to me. Could you tell us a little bit about that sort of continuing fight for freedom of, of expression? I mean, you know, you've had that, you've had that time, you've had that experience. What are you, what are your plans now? Where are you sort of heading with that, if anywhere? Oh yes, sure. Um, uh, I've started my own foundation in Vancouver. It's called the Fahmy <coughs> Foundation. I formed it with my lawyers and my wife. Uh, basically, uh, when you go through an experience like this, you're a changed man, and you do, you know that you want to help others because so many people helped you. Uh, part of my foundation is to provide financial assistance to journalists behind bars because. Uh, the thousands of letters we received was it raised our morale, but in my case, for example, I was paying for my legal fees, so um, the money and that was donated really helped me uh, take care of my legal fees, uh, so I'm doing the same thing now, and we've gained so much experience in what works and what not, and we're building on the, con the um, uh, you know, the, the people that we met and uh, so I'm very excited in continuing on that path, and I've taken on specific cases um, that I'm very, I feel very strongly about. Um, I could mention them now. Some of them are, you know, like uh, Shaukan, Mahmoud Shaukan. He's a photographer in Egypt who spent uh, two years in prison. He was just referred to court uh, recently, and uh, on December 15th is his trial, spending his third birthday. He was caught after the Rabah dispersal with two other Westerners. Um, they were released. He was kept behind. He has no political affiliations. He's sick. I'm in contact with his family and his lawyers. We have Mohammed Al Ajami, a Qatari poet in uh, Qatar. Also, I'm in contact with his lawyer. He's spending 15 years for one um, uh, uh, line in a poem about the Arab Spring. And uh, Jason Rezian, of course, and his brother is constantly on the phone with me. He spent 448 days on Friday um, for another bogus case of espionage that has no um, meaning whatsoever. His lawyer can't even speak to the press. And I've you know, communicated with his team. We have Atina, another car uh, cartoonist. She's Iranian. She drew cartoons in a about the parliament. She's spending 12 years in prison. Uh, Raif Badawi, his wife, I'm sure you've, you've seen her efforts in Saudi Arabia, 10 years and 1,000 lashes. And all he did was he criticized uh, Saudi clerics, and he's not even criticizing Islam or anything like that. And if you see the, <laughs> the, the judgment that of the sentence, you know, there's mm -hmm. stuff like he liked the pages of Facebook, specific pages that weren't very welcome. And finally, um, um, Wubsha Tay, he's an Ethiopian journalist, uh, he's, in, he's been inside for four years. And finally, last night, the Vice News team also mentioned to me Mohammed Rasul. And this is something very important about Mohammed Rasul. All these people I mentioned are now in the clogged judicial system, if you want to call it a system in these countries. But 
Um, here is something I learned, and I spoke to um, the British uh, members of the British Parliament here today, and I spoke to the government here in England, and I will be speaking more when I go back to Canada, that the importance of intervention at the highest level as soon as the arrest happens, because if there's a chance of extracting your citizen, it could happen immediately in that window before the citizen is referred to court, and then it becomes complicated and for, the pres for a presidential intervention. So I believe the intervention should come from the highest um, level in that country, immediate to the president, before it gets worse. And if this prisoner is not extracted or deported, then at least it will improve your prison situations. You might get a bed, you might get better outings, you might, you might even save your life in some cases, to be honest. So I do believe that so much needs to be done. We need to unite as journalists. We need to uh, continue um, uh, fighting for freedom of expression. And again, I've said it on and on, and I'm saying it in Egypt and everywhere I go, that um, the right to know and to report freely and safely is uh, what real democracy stands for. And um, um, I believe that uh, if the Egyptian government realizes this matter clearly, it will be a positive development in their path for a democratic state. Excellent. Thank you, Mario. I'm going to allow the audience to sort of pick up on some of those points and, but not yet, sorry, and sort of focus in on, on Egypt specifically. But I mean, you know, you've got a lot of experience across the region as a journalist, and you've highlighted a lot of those cases. When we started speaking a few minutes ago, you were talking, you know, with, with um, considerable excitement, we could say, about the Arab Spring. You know, you're part of that Arab Spring. As we're now coming to sort of the fifth anniversary of the Arab Spring, is there anything left of it? Is there, is there a legacy? Is there something sustainable or tangible? Or is it basically canned? Is it over? Because as we look around the region, it really is doom and gloom. It's very hard to find positive stories. Where do you sort of see the Arab Spring having gone? Um, I see the political parties are much weaker. I see the political parties, uh, if there was any chance that the parties had any positive uh, uh, path, uh, they have become almost uh, you know, non-existent, uh, that in Egypt and in other uh, countries. Uh, press freedom is uh, at its worst. I've, right now, 65 people, have, journalists have died just this year and 64 last year, and there's over 200 in prison. Um, the civil liberties, it's almost like what would happen in World War II, right after World War II, where, you know, where national security comes ahead of civil liberties and the so-called war on terror is being used to clamp down on civil liberties and human rights and press freedoms. And, um, you know, I, I don't see, I don't think it's positive at the moment. And that is why there's a lot to be done. I do understand there's an unprecedented wave of terrorism, and I lived with these people inside, and I know that you know, what they stand for is what we need to com exactly fight, but that doesn't mean that we uh, let them win. Because, for example, in prison, during the Charlie Hebdo and the slaying of my friend Stephen Sotloff, who visited me before his trip to Syria, uh, they were celebrating. And they continue to celebrate uh, when they hear news that Canada, for example, is issuing, you know, bills that, uh, again, limit the freedom of... Uh, civil rights and that the Egyptians are, you know, uh, uh, really, you know, announcing these terrorism laws and, uh, and you know, so it's letting them win is not what we should uh, support and uh, this is why I come out of this experience uh, more um, focused on doing work other than journalism, aside from my journalism, to just try to, you know, build on what I've seen inside and, you know, uh, it's a situation, I see it very bleak, and I'm, uh, excuse me if I sound a little bit negative, uh, but uh, I just am trying to see any positive developments, and uh, I may be working with other groups to try and reach that goal. There's, there's a very interesting, painful kind of dichotomy when one looks at the media space across the region, because to a large extent, you can see there is a clampdown on the freedom of expression, very much so at the state level. And yet you have organizations like ISIS that are using sort of media platforms 
in an almost an ungoverned space. So in a way, there's, there's a greater, not creativity, but, th but there's a greater opportunity for groups that operate outside the system and use social media than the more traditional sort of media institutions which are necessarily constrained. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a, a very real imbalance in that. Yeah. Well, in, in general, the social media has um, you know, taken over our lives in the sense, you know, for Egypt, in Egypt, for example, you have, um, last year, uh, you would have newspapers um, being uh, printed two million copies a day. Now you have 500,000 copies a day. The social media has taken over um, in every sense, uh, be it in, through how these groups use it and the sophistication that they have uh, gained. And I've met some of them inside who would fit anywhere uh, and they speak perfect English and they're experts at um, you know, computer and programming and uh, you know, so yes, I do believe, and I've seen you know laws again that are being released in Egypt and in other places that are you know they're very um, you know they very they, they, they're so, you know they're they're making our lives harder, but as well, uh, but I do understand that um, there needs to be such uh, laws, but I, I believe there has to be some other way of dealing with these groups that does not affect us. Um, and yes, the social media is, is a challenge to control, um, but you know, I, I'm not too happy with the way things are going in terms of how we are being uh, you know, caught in the middle. Sure, <laughs> thank you, thank you.